with Janet. Um, and, and what I mean by that is um, she just has a perspective that she ground, for me, she, she, I think she grounds us. She's involved in a lot of our meetings, involved in our conversations with the plaintiff's attorneys, and uh, involved in, in, in leadership teams. Um, she's one of our parent consultants uh, that we use. Um, and it just feels like she grounds us. It feels like she brings a, 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 a smart approach towards this, a realistic approach to this that doesn't say all things have to be done all at once, um, but really helps us sort of understand that we have to keep moving forward uh, even though we don't um, have the opportunity to get everything done right now. So uh, without any further ado, I'll let her uh, introduce herself to you. So thank you all very much. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first ever Nash or regional, sorry, regional TCOM conference. My name is Janet Hecke, and I am a member of the Idaho Parent Network. Ross gave us a great lead in this morning. Thank you, Ross. Transformational Collaborative Outcomes Management. Is it? <laughs> that's a mouthful. Doesn't it sound like a life-altering group experience that's going to be graded and compared to your peers? <laughs> no wonder we have an acronym for it, TCOM. It's a whole lot less intimidating when it sounds like an expressway. Just take I-85 north to the TCOM and keep going west till you hit the ocean. <laughs> then we all hear words like communimetric banting about, and my first thought, am I going to be stuck in a lecture hall while we commune with the metric system? British jail, anyone? <laughs> so what is this TCOM all about? What does it mean for the parents, practitioners, and people working to transform the system of care? Transformational, enormous change, complete and total change in form or appearance. Have you ever considered what happens to a butterfly? You're going along with your daily life, you're marching with the leaves, you're enjoying some sunshine, when suddenly you're stuck. You can't move. You crane your neck, you're attached to the stick. Whoa, Nellie, I don't like this. And then, your skin splits down your back, causing excruciating pain as it peels off and shrivels up around your ankles, exposing your soft underbelly. You're probably not saying, dang, mama can only see me now. <laughs> as a parent of a child with serious emotional disturbance, I can tell you, when our child is in crisis, we feel like this caterpillar with our skin split and shriveled up around our ankles and our soft underbelly exposed. When we have to put out there the day-to-day -day reality of living with a child with serious emotional disturbance, in order to get the help that we need, because our parenting, let me scratch that, any parenting coupled with the services already being received are insufficient to ward off the looming crisis, we feel exposed. We're vulnerable, and like this caterpillar, we're afraid that our child may not ever master the skills necessary to transition to adulthood, or maybe even survive the weekend. We're overwhelmed at the prospect of transformation, and it leaves us saying, no, 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 I'm fine as a caterpillar, thank you very much. I don't need a chrysalis, and wings, totally overrated. No, I'm fine as a caterpillar, thank you much. And you'll find me right here munching on my leaf when you realize I'm right. I love this quote. People prefer the certainty of misery to the misery of uncertainty. Can you relate to this? Maybe there was a time in your life when you or a loved one was very ill. You went to the doctor. The doctor wanted to run some tests. At these times, we're already suffering. But the thought of what the results will reveal creates a fear that increases the suffering we're already enduring. Transformations are filled with uncertainty. Parents of children with serious emotional disturbance frequently feel as if we're walking on eggshells. And believe me, Misery is an apt description of what it feels like to spend day after day after day on your tiptoes trying not to disturb the eggshells. There's such a fine balance we have to maintain in our homes 
in order to not trigger our child, especially when you consider that we're not in control of all of the different things that can start a meltdown. So what can we do to combat the inherent desire humans have for certainty? Get curious. It's normal. It's human to cling to the rock of certainty when the waves of the unknown threaten to wash us away. But you can ride the wave if you're courageous enough to take the leap. You may get pounded by the waves occasionally, but if you spend your life on that rock, you will spend your life navigating eggshells on your tiptoes, and that is the certainty of misery. Curiosity is scary. Before we take that leap, we don't know if we're gonna ride that wave or have it smash us up against the rock. Curiosity ask the questions necessary to keep us safe. Unfortunately, we frequently try to fit the unknown into our experience. This is one of the biggest barriers to transformation. It's the story we tell ourselves. When something is happening that we don't understand, we tell ourselves a story instead of getting curious. We try to find certainty in the unexplainable, and to do so, we fill in the gaps with something that makes sense to us, something that's consistent with our experience. A driver cuts us off as we're going down the highway nearly causing an accident. You jerk, why don't you pay attention to the other people on the road? You're the reason we have so many accidents. Or you're walking on a beach, and you pass a couple, and a few steps later you hear them laugh. And suddenly, you're completely self-conscious about the swimsuit you're wearing. We all do it. The consequence, however, is that certainty halts transformation, or at the very least, makes it a whole lot more painful. When you replace your fear of the unknown with curiosity, you're empowered to discover a new path and transform. Sometimes, our experiences rip the solid ground out from beneath our feet. <clears throat> My son, ending his own life at 18, was one of these times for me. And it left me wondering, how could he have been in so much pain for so long that he lost all hope of the future? Why did he see this as his best or only option? What did we miss? Where did I go so wrong? He was not here to ask, so I told myself stories to fill in these gaps. I've told myself so many stories over the last eight years about why my son made the choice he made, and each of these stories eased the uncertainty, uncertainty and temporarily answered these unanswerable questions. The stories felt like a helmet protecting my journey. You know what? Other people told themselves stories about what happened too. And sometimes those stories left me feeling like that caterpillar hung out to dry with my protective skin down around my ankles and their stories shredded my exposed heart. Stories like, he must have been abused because that's the only way somebody becomes suicidal so young. He took the easy way out. <clears throat> it's only children of middle-class parents who complete suicide because the families put so much pressure on them. <coughs> Maybe these stories eased their uncertainty over why someone would choose to end their own life, but telling these stories severed trust between us where curiosity could have built a bridge to greater understanding. But I can't point fingers without pointing one at myself as well. You see, several years ago, I met several parents of children with serious emotional disturbance. Now here was a story that seemed to fit perfectly. How could someone who knew he was loved beyond measure actually pull the trigger? He had a serious emotional disturbance. How could he have felt like all hope was gone? He had a serious emotional disturbance. What did we miss? The diagnosis of the serious emotional disturbance. It isn't like we didn't know he was suffering. 
He made his first attempt to end his own life at age 11. But the professionals never settled on a diagnosis, and frequently the only help they could offer us wasn't better therapeutic treatment or other medications. It was different parenting. Telling myself that the only way my son could have made the choice to end a life that meant so much to so many was because his brain just didn't function normally, well, that was a story that seemed to fit perfectly. The insidious part of the stories we tell ourselves is that there frequently is an element of truth to them, and they give us the illusion of control. It just feels so good to fill in the uncertain parts and to have even the illusion of a modicum of control when your life feels so chaotic. You see, the stories we tell ourselves, they're all fine and dandy when they're in a nice, neat little package and don't start to fray around the edges. Life has a way of tearing at the wrapper and fraying the ribbon. I believe this is because certainty, like the stories, like the pretty little box wrapped in the stories we tell ourselves, halts all movement and allows us to dig in, giving us the illusion of control. But life shifts. And the harder we fight and cling to the stories we tell ourselves, the more out of sync our reality becomes. Our stories bump up against other experiences and other perspectives. And one day, the string of the ribbon snags on someone else's experiential hook, the bow becomes unraveled, and the neat little package bursts open. It was just a couple of weeks ago when this story package of why my son chose to end his life hooked on someone else's reality. I was deep in a conversation with a dear friend over suicidality and serious emotional disturbance. And I shared with them this belief, this story that I've been telling myself that the only way <laughs> my son or really any child could choose to end their own life was that they were suffering from a serious emotional disturbance. My friend got very quiet. The air between us grew thick and it threatened to choke off our connection. So I tried getting curious and I asked why they were suddenly so quiet. They took a deep breath and said to me, I have struggled with thoughts of suicidality every day of my life for as far back as I can remember. Do you think I have a mental illness too? Whoa, that was like a sucker punch straight to my heart. Here the story I had been telling myself about my son was shredding their heart the same way other people's stories about my son had shredded mine. And like my son, if they hadn't shared this with me, I never would have known this was a struggle for them. This conversation reopened a ton of questions for me. Questions I don't and may never have the answers to. But I'm learning to be okay with the uncertainty. To question why I feel the need to fill in the gaps. Because unacknowledged and unexplored, these stories choke off our ability to find deeper meaning and possibilities. Collaborative produced or conducted by two or more parties working together. Since the transformation process is so exposing of our soft underbelly, the collabor collaboration becomes the chrysalis that surrounds the transformation. The people that surround us when we need to transform, I call them my tribe, each play a vital role in allowing and encouraging the transformation to take place. They stabilize our surroundings. They help us stay curious during the transformation. And they infuse the process with hope when we can't see past the pain. When you're entrenched in a position and the stories you tell yourself have validated your point of view, the chrysalis tribe holds open space for other possibilities. They illuminate the fears that drive our certainty they provide encouragement 
and a valuable perspective on the transformation they see taking place. When a child, company, or system of care goes through transformation, it's the job of the collaborative team to form a chrysalis of trust and protection and encouragement. It should be a safe space where all perspectives are not only sought out, but explored to create greater understanding. For the last eight years, I've been surat surrounded by a chrysalis tribe. I have added new supportive people to my team, and I have had to let go of people who were unwilling or unable to own their own stories about my experience. This chrysalis team are people I have come to trust, to love, and to know will challenge me when I dig in without opening a gaping emotional pit that I would then have to dig myself out of. They provided the helmet to my emotional heart injury. This tribe of people held open space for me to walk with my grief and nudged me along the way. When I would latch on to a point of view and entrench myself in the certainty that I just had to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, someone would inevitably offer me a rounder perspective. And then they would all hold space for me while I considered other options. So many times they offered me round wheels. No thanks, I got this. So many times they showed me how round wheels might make a difference. Sorry, too busy, I just have to keep pushing. At times, I'm sure they felt I would never see the other side of my grief. I sure am glad they never gave up on me. Being a part of a collaborative team means never giving up. It means things will get tough and they will stall and you agree to keep being curious, to keep seeking other perspectives, to keep holding space for transformation. When you're on the precipice of a transformation, it's easy to see how we might not be too excited about taking that first step. Just because we can see the other side of the chasm doesn't mean we're willing to do everything it takes to get there on our own. That first step is a doozy. As humans, our instinct is to run from pain. Most of us were never taught how to hold it, how to sit with it. And most of us were never taught how to hold this space for others. We want to fix it for them, to ease their pain. For collaboration to occur, the Chrysalis team must come together to help us face our stories, integrate them into our lives, and engage together to build the bridge necessary to safely traverse the, the divide. To do so, each member needs to be comfortable with their own story about their position on the team, and have identified and be willing to suspend the story they're telling themselves about the child and family. When two people are looking at the same event and one sees three, while the other is just as certain there are four, it can be very difficult to hold space for that, for the other perspective. But it is a necessary part of collaboration. There's a story from the book, Chicken Soup for the Soul, by Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen that I believe explains and expresses the shift that occurs when someone is willing to own their own experience and share their perspective. I haven't read this story in years, but I'll try and paraphrase it for you here. A father and his two sons are getting on a subway train at rush hour. The father sits down, settles into his chair, and the two boys start racing up and down the aisle, climbing over chairs, bumping into people. The passengers on the train are getting pretty annoyed because dad's not doing anything. This goes on for a while, and finally one passenger's just had it. He leans over to the dad and says, aren't you gonna do anything to control your kids? The dad looks up. He looks around and finds his children, turns to the passenger and says, I'm so sorry. Their mother just died, and I have no idea how I'm gonna tell them. In that split second, the story that every passenger on that train had been telling themselves about this father was wiped away. 
Wouldn't it be great if it was that easy to identify the stories we're telling, them, telling ourselves about someone else or about ourselves? The reality is, it's hard work. It's hard to identify these stories, and it's even harder to open up space for another interpretation. You remember that caterpillar during transformation? Well, transformation isn't like going to sleep a caterpillar and then waking up this beautiful butterfly. <clears throat> If it is, that must be one heck of a dream. You go to sleep a caterpillar, your skin rips off, shrivels down, all your innards are transformed into butterfly wings and antenna, and then your organs are crammed into a much tinier little space. Even Walt Disney would have a hard time getting people to stand in line for that nightmarish ride. No thanks, I'm fine as a caterpillar. On the other hand, how cool would it be to have wings and fly? to leave that old familiar leaf behind and transform into a lightweight, beautiful creature that could dance on the wind. Leaving the familiar behind to leap into an uncertain future is scary. Even when the future you imagine can be very inviting. I can tell you, for parents of children with serious emotional disturbance, the future looks more like a daunting daily journey through marine boot camp than it does sitting on the beach eating bonbons. So surrounding yourself with a trusted tribe who are curious about your experience, your feelings, your thoughts and ideas, and importantly, who share the same vision is vital to the process. Have the courage to show up. Don't just let the parents be vulnerable sharing their experience. Be vulnerable protecting it. Be empathetic with it. Be unrelenting in working through the successes and the failures. There'll be failures. There'll be backsliding and stalls and contention. But when you slide in home plate at the end of your, at the end of your event, you will have experienced something you can be proud of and you will have witnessed the transformation to a butterfly. <coughs> Outcomes. The way things turn out. A consequence. In the end, we all want the butterfly. Well, actually, there's even another perspective to that because I have a friend who is terrified of butterflies. <laughs> this is the reason collaboration is so important. It enables everyone's perspective to matter because everyone's experience is different. Each of these pictures shows the experience of a butterfly, and yet each would describe their experience differently. Having all the perspectives at the table enables the collabor collaborative team to come together around a shared vision. This is the vision of Systems of Care implementing TCOM in Idaho 35 years ago, we were a very happy caterpillar, quite certain that change was neither fun nor necessary. But the settlement agreement came along and forced the collaborative team to form in order to transform our system of care into one that provides the support necessary for our children and family to develop the wings they need to fly. This shared vision is the outcome we are all working towards. Having a shared goal in mind allows different perspectives to be valued. It allows the team to get creative in considering how best to support the transformation. As the transformation process progresses, the shared vision may also transform. Progress, even incremental progress, can open up options that were previously thought to be impossible. Everyone's perspective is a little different. Your experience dramatically influences your perspective. The outcomes are determined by the shared vision of your team, be it a child and family team or all the entities in a state system of care. Each perspective matters. I am terrible at seeing negative space. Filled space, I'm pretty good with that, but negative space or emptiness, not so much. It's why I was never a great shot when I played hockey, because when I would take that shot, I would shoot for the space I saw, typically filled by the goalie. 
When you look at this picture, do you first see the chalice or the faces? What about in this one? For me, I immediately see the faces in the first picture and the chalice in the second. For others of you, you saw the exact opposite. And some of you can see both perspectives easily. With practice, we can all learn to see other perspectives. We all experience these pictures differently, so it's not a stretch to think how we might not all experience the same event in the same way. Your perspective matters. When I came to my first meeting of the Idaho Parent Network four years ago, I didn't think my perspective mattered. Not because I didn't believe or value my experience, but because at the time, I didn't think my son had a serious emotional disturbance. And after the story I relayed to you earlier, maybe that perspective is right, but that will always have an uncertain conclusion. Sitting in that room with 12 other parents, I really wondered if I belonged there. The room was stiff with fear and pain as one by one, we introduced ourselves with our parenting journey. We relayed the icky, sticky, ugly truths of raising a child with serious, serious emotional disturbance, and our shattered emotions fell like shards on the floor. One after the other, we held open space for the painful realities of each of our lives. Our collective outer shell gave way, the floodgates opened, and we cried like a woman only cries in her pink fuzzy bunny slippers long after all the warmth has left the evening air. We showed each other our blankets of blame and shame that we used to justify our isolation and our failure to parent our children out of their mental illness. But as the last of us finished conveying our journey, the sun rose on those icky, sticky, ugly truths. The reality of our collective blankets of blame and shame and our universal feelings of isolation and failure gave way and transformed into a network of connectedness and support. We were all living with the elephant in the room, and yet individually, we couldn't see that our singular experience mirrored that of other parents if you haven't raised a child like ours, you can't possibly know what you don't know. If you want the outcomes to matter, be willing to get comfortable with our blankets and build the connections necessary to help us navigate the shards of our lives until those shards transform into a beautiful mosaic that together we imagined could be the outcome. I can't count the times in my son's life when I wanted something different for him than he wanted. Can you all relate to this? I wanted my son to enjoy school. He thought it was something he had to endure. I wanted my son to see how his disposition transformed for the better when he was in nature or when he was enjoying some physical experience. He wanted a game with his friends. Ultimately, I wanted my son to live. The psychiatrists, psychologists, school counselors, teachers, friends, they all had other outcomes they wanted for him too. But no matter how much we cared and how deeply we desired him to want something else, it didn't make him want them. I have a very good friend whose son experienced a significant school trauma early in his life and who struggles with autism and bipolar disorder. Recently, he was re-triggered in school again, and many of his old behaviors came flooding back with a vengeance. The child and family team came together, and they articulated a variety of goals for him to go to school, to actually attend class when he was in school, to speak respectfully, to learn to manage his anger without throwing things through the wall. All these things seemed reason like reasonable goals that were necessary to achieve their larger, long-term shared vision of him successfully launching to adulthood. But if they had proceeded with changing the treatment plan without asking her son what he wanted, well, likely would have ended up more like this surgery, 
They would have had an amazing treatment plan to meet their goals, and the child, well, his participation probably would have been dead on arrival because his goal was to go on a date. Yep, that's right. A year after transitioning home from a residential treatment facility, he wanted to go on a date. I have to admit, when I heard this the first time, in my mind, I scoffed. Yeah, right. The same child that can't tolerate not being allowed access to unlimited Cheez-Its is going to be able to tolerate the nearly unfathomable uncertainty of going on a date. Maybe they should stick to a more realistic goal. All I can say is it's a darn good thing no one on this child and family team heard the thoughts going on in my head and paid attention to them. Because the team got creative. They came back together and discussed what would need to happen for him to be ready to go on a date. What would his thinking look like? What would his behaviors look like? What did he consider a date? The child, by valuing everyone's, ex by valuing everyone's expected perspective, excuse me, and getting creative about treatment planning, they were able to move forward towards their shorter term goal of him going on a date and realized that all the skills he was developing to learn how to go on a date were all the same skills that were necessary for him to successfully launch to adulthood. The child, parents, and team were all engaged and actually kind of excited about having a goal that might result in positive change for all concerned. It would have been easy for the parents or the team members to have lost all hope or thought like I did that there was no chance of him ever going on a date. But how normalizing, how hopeful it is for this family to have their son want something so normal for someone his age, especially when you consider all the struggles they had all endured together. When the team tackles the problem at hand, by forming a protective chrysalis around what needs to be transformed, values and includes every perspective equally, is comfortable with the uncertainty of how, when, and what outcomes will be achieved, and comes together around a shared vision, communication is strengthened, creativity abounds, hope is restored, and growth happens. Outcomes like the ones for this child and family inspire a team to keep doing the challenging work of transforming and collaborating. Management. The practice of dealing with or controlling things or people. Dr. Lyons says we manage what we measure. So what we measure is of vital importance to the transformation, collaboration, and outcomes for every child, region, and state in a system of care. In this day and age of evidence-based practices, data collection, and data-driven outcomes, it's easy to believe that we have all the data necessary to see what works and what doesn't. But what if the data looks like what's above ground in this picture? <coughs> if you don't get curious about the stories underneath we might end up focusing on the carrot greens that ultimately we throw away to the detriment of the carrot that actually sustains us and helps us grow. We have all been trained to look at a graph and assign meaning to it. But like the child in this picture, it's all too easy to look at just the data that supports our perspective to the exclusion of what doesn't match our experience or what we can't easily explain. <laughs> Data points are like snapshots. Each data point describes something that really happened to real people and it mattered to them. It's the stories that make up the numbers that give voice to the data. So if we're not curious about the snapshot of the lives that comprise each data point, then we may miss important elements in the picture. Elements that reveal an important trend or missing data. If what matters most is the transformation of people's lives, then that is what we must measure. We must take a deep dive into the data to discover the stories behind the trends. 
Without curiosity, we are likely to miss what is not included in the data at all or draw conclusions based on too few perspectives. If all we see in the data is an elephant and we overlook the grass and the sky and the myriad changes in form and color, then getting curious and going back to the stories that make up the outcome will likely reveal subtle or substantial changes needed to our system or some aspect of our system of care. Data without stories are just numbers and numbers can't tell us anything by themselves. Our data points are snapshots of the lives of our Idaho families. Together, they combine to create a mosaic rich in lives well lived. I am often asked how to engage families or loved ones in their care. There are some underlying assumptions in this question that probably warrant further exploration another day. But everything tea comes about, everything from the caterpillar through the sometimes painful chrysalis transformation to the butterfly outcome is engagement. Engagement is the art of communication and art requires practice. It demands suspending the stories we're telling ourselves and believing everyone is doing the best we can. It takes exploring new techniques and getting curious. We are all embarking on a new transformation in Idaho. It's going to be painful at times. It has contained a lot of contention and will always contain loads of uncertainty. It requires all of us to suspend the stories we tell ourselves at least long enough to hear and incorporate other perspectives. It requires assuming everyone is doing the best they can in that moment. Even when we know what we should do, we won't always do it perfectly. It requires developing new skills, new approaches, and getting curious. Discomfort is a necessity, and so is holding space for the transformation. If you're entirely comfortable with how you do your job, or you're entirely comfortable with how you're doing your parenting, then I have a sneaking suspicion you might be anchored and transformation might feel more like waking up in the middle of a WWF ring than with wings. You have an amazing opportunity over the next two days to suspend the stories you tell yourself about your parenting, your children, your patients, your profession, your skills, your job, and all the entities in the state system of care and be open to other experiences. I encourage you to share your experience. Connect, communicate, collaborate, reimagine, and get curious. I hope you soak up every minute of the experience, and maybe you'll even transform some aspect of your life through your collaboration in this conference. Thank you. <laughs>